Okay, thank you. I, I, I'm here on behalf of my uh, co-chairs of this summit, uh, Dean Marcelo Suarez Verasco and Associate Chancellor uh, Marquita Gnarchier and Fred Uy. And I first, what we have seen so far, last night uh, that program blew me, blew me away. I hope you had the same experience. And this morning we set the stage. For that I want to thank uh, Chancellor uh, Block, Chancellor White, and Professor Jerry Brown. <laughs> thank you, that was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> but he, he, he's not hearing that. <laughs> Professor Jerry Brown, I, I just called you first your new title. And, and Professor Eric Grignot. So they set the stage. Now we are here uh, for the main uh, objective of this meeting. We are releasing this report. So who are the we? Uh, it's basically a combination of uh, UC, CSU, and numerous other educators and several NGOs. And uh, I want to introduce this report. Uh, this was not planned. So the way this is going to happen is that I'm going to give you about five to seven minutes on what this report uh, is achieve, uh, accomplishing to do, and then introduce our panel members. Each of them will give a five-minute presentation, and then we'll have a 15, 20 minutes uh, open discussion. If you have any question, raise your hands. I may or may not take the questions, depending on the time. So who, first, the next one is, who are we? Uh, we are an interdisciplinary team of educators, scientists, and policymakers. And you see the key institutions. And I must acknowledge 10 strands, which played a major role, along with the team at UCLA. And I must acknowledge the editor of this report, Lee Levine, and she has been in touch with you, many of you. So uh, let me just start with my favorite reason of why we are here. I couldn't find a better uh, quote than this. Said, if you plan this for a year, plant rice. Certainly in California, please don't plant rice. It's very water intensive. If your plan is for 10 years, plant trees, definitely for us. But if your plan is for 100 years, educate children. Uh, that's, I can't think of a better justification than that. And I wanted to tell you a little bit, uh, add to this, and, and why I am here. Uh, I, my first paper on this was published in 1975. It's almost 45 years, and I collected data on this from uh, satellites. I helped NASA design the first climate satellite in the 70s, collected data from aircraft, ships, and more recently from drones, and documenting the destruction of the planet in various parts of the world. So when I looked at all this data two years ago, a student of mine and I published a study concluding that if we go on the present course, there is a 5% probability that we are all facing extinction. I think many of us, when we talk about climate change, we talk about the poor, which we have to. But what we shouldn't forget is this extinction applies to all of us. The poor may go down that cliff first. We would be following them in 10, 20 years' time. So this 5% probability is 40 years from now. So I want to tell you, that's a you know, mathematical way to say it. What does it really mean? To me, this captures it. That if I tell you 5% probability is a 1 in 20 chance. If I tell you there's a 1 in 20 chance of this plane going to crash, none of us would get into it. Even if I tell you there's one in 100 chance, we still wouldn't get on that plane. 
We wouldn't get on that plane even for one in a thousand chance. But we are sending our children and grandchildren on that plane. So, and I have four grandchildren, so that's the dismal outlook I'm looking at. So how do I uh, still continue working on this area? Because there is hope, as uh, Prof Professor Jerry Brown and Professor Eric Grignot said, there's still time. <clears throat> I'll, I'll tell you my own way of looking at that. We just published a study last year in Nature showing that the planet would reach a degree and a half warming 10 years from now. That's a 50% amplification of the warming from what we have experienced up to 2015, which is a degree. When that happens, it will happen by probabilities at least 50%, if not more. Climate change wouldn't be happening to someone 100 miles away. It will be in your living room. Each of you would be experiencing those extremes in one way or the other. I'm thinking that's when Americans and the world citizens would all sign for massive change. See, that this current lacuna is not going to continue. We will take actions. And what we are trying to eclipse is prepare millions of climate stewards. I personally like to call them climate warriors, but my committee said, no, that's too aggressive. So our committee, uh, we have, I want to tell you, uh, in addition to the four co-chairs, we have a steering committee, which reaches all across California, all the way from north to the southern tip of California. And then we have three subcommittees. So together, there are 50 of us who have worked on this problem for the last two years. I want to thank uh, President Janet Napolitano in person and uh, Chancellor White for supporting this. And I must recognize uh, one person is responsible for why I'm here. He is the silent hero here, Matt St. Clair from the uh, Office of the President. So let me move on. So what is our motivation? Climate disruption and crises requires fundamental societal transformation. Education must be one of the pillars, but that education must start from PK, pre-kindergarten to 12, and continue through adulthood. So that's the, what we are uh, striving to do. So, uh, and, and what's our goal? empower as many as 500,000 high school graduates each year with climate literate. And that's the official word, and I would just say in person, empower as many as 500,000 high school climate warriors each year. And fortunately, we are not starting from scratch. There's tremendous amount of work going on in California. Just like we are a living laboratory for climate education, I mean, climate mitigation and adaptation, we are also a beautiful living laboratory to build on. So we want to amplify and refine what's going on now, commence new initiatives, and those new initiatives will bring the climate focus. And, uh, and, and what we need to educate our children they have to know the urgency situation. We cannot just soft pedal this and turn them loose. 10 years from now, they're gonna get, face a lot worse world than what we are facing. But we have to give them sense of hope. Exactly what, uh, you know, Garen Cherry Brown said and Eric said. So there are many things happening and I wanna introduce you, each of you to them. The first is uh, the University of California, 50 faculty of us, have created a new education protocol. The first one is a hybrid course. And it focuses just two lectures on science. The rest of it is all about solutions, technologies, market instruments, governance, societal transformation, etc. So it's being taught in six campuses. 
And thanks to Professor Sam Shen, it's being taught at CSU in San Diego. It's being taught at Stockholm University. They're working with us to take it all over Europe. And it's being taught in Taiwan. And I'm hoping to persuade, with the help of Governor Jerry Brown, using his China Institute to take this course to China. We just, in this uh, meeting, we are releasing this digital textbook funded by uh, Bill Gates Foundation. It's available online. Anyone can download it. And then we are developing, we have developed an online version of this course. I can s sit at UCLA and teach all 10 campuses, okay? And then the MOOC. We are releasing this, a four course certification program. So what do they accomplish? There are three things we are trying to do in Eclipse. First, teach the teachers, right? They have to know before they can teach it. So there are two sorts of teachers, one who are in colleges now, and we want to educate them so that they can teach, and then we, can, we, we call them pre-service, and then those who are already school teachers, we have to bring them up to speed, and that's where the MOOC can help them. I want to mention next one, a phenomenal thing which is also being just announced in this meeting, a new knowledge to action network has been created, and that's their website. I'm part of this, and it was uh, you know, co-directors of John Foran of UC and Sarah Ray. That effort on that side, you can go to capture everything that's going on in California on education. It's a resource. And the third is that on the high school, there is an array of impressive stuff which has been going with the government uh, help. There is the Education and the Environment Initiative. They have a curriculum. There is a blueprint for environmental literacy. And then there's a California Regional Environmental Education Network, California's Environmental Principles and Concepts. We heard it from Senator Ben Allen yesterday. He talked about this and then the California Science Teacher Association. So we have an impressive array of work already there, okay? And I think what we are hoping to receive here, in addition to what we have panel members, your insight and feedback in, into either on the recommendations or how to implement it. We already heard uh, I, I, what I think is a phenomenally practical way to do this from Governor Jerry Brown. Don't try to mandate it, but try to use the current you know, framework. With that, I, we have distinguished panel members today. There are two panels. In the first panel, we want to discuss the policy aspects of it. How do we implement it? How do we scale it? And then how do we go from California outside? Our s slogan here, California today, the nation tomorrow, and the world the day after. So to address uh, all this, so with the first panel is on the policy side, and the second panel, we'll hear from a set of educators. So I'm delighted to invite uh, first, uh, Kate Gordon, uh, Director of the Governor's Office of Planning and Research. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. Those of you who work in education know, of course, that we all build on the foundation of those that come before us, and we in the Newsom administration are building on the foundation set by Governor G Jerry Brown, who has set just an unbelievable, strong, and impressive, and world-leading foundation on climate change. So everything I do, we do, is because of him. So thank you, Governor. So climate change, I'll talk just for a few minutes um, about this and looking forward to the discussion. Climate change, uh, I was really pleased to see in the report uh, the, the approach of systems thinking and to hear this morning Governor Brown, the chancellors talk about systems thinking. 
This is really where we as an administration, the Newsom administration, are thinking about climate. It is part of and integrated into everything else we do. In some ways, there's no more stark reminder of why you need to do that than the first week of his administration in which the fires, climate driven, as you heard, led to PG&E, our largest utility, declaring bankruptcy, and the ratings agencies downgrading the ratings of all three of our major utilities. All of a sudden, climate change is not just an environmental issue in the state, it becomes a business issue, an economic issue, a legal issue, a health issue, an air quality issue. Every one of those things has come into play, and I'll tell you there is no, unfortunately, better way to underscore and emphasize to an administration why we need to be thinking about this across every single agency and every part of the, universe, of, of the government and the university than that. So again, not just an environmental, not just an energy issue, but a macroeconomic issue. And I like to think of it as like globalization, like automation. Climate change presents risks and it presents opportunities. It presents a global reality that has profoundly local impacts across every single thing we do. Not over here in the Environmental Sciences Department, not over here in the Sustainability Officer's Office, not over here in our Resources Agency, but every single thing we do. And doing that, talking about it that way, requires a shift in thinking. It's a systems thinking shift, it's a climate literacy shift, and you know, one of the things I wanted to talk about a little bit is doing that both internally and externally. I think Governor Brown made a really important point about doing that in the university itself, not just thinking about this as something we're teaching or, or making policies about or educating people about, but actually looking within our institutions and doing climate literacy across and within the institutions. That's something that we, in the Newsom administration, honestly has spent the last 11 months doing, um, starting with that week of the fires, really saying, how do we break down some of the silos in our own government and do climate literacy across our own agencies and institutions so this becomes underpinning everything else we do? And the governor did an executive order in October that I think sort of puts a cap on that to some extent, which says climate change needs to be, or we need to align our investments through our pension funds and the UC pension system. We need to align our assets and our investments uh, internally through our Department of General Services and our transportation system all with our climate goals. None of the things we do as a major investor and asset owner as, an as a university, or I keep saying university because I'm thinking I'm at a university, as, as a government, uh, nothing we do should not be aligned with our climate goals. And that means all of a sudden our road builders are thinking about this. It means all of a sudden our facilities managers are thinking about this. So I would just deeply encourage us to think about climate literacy in that way. How do we think about literacy across these institutions. And what we always say is that, you know, not all of our state jobs now are green jobs, but we have greened every job that exists in the state of California through these shifts. And that's what we need to do throughout our institutions as well. I thought Chancellor White uh, pivoting to workforce was really important and very consistent with Governor Newsom's approach on education. As you know, he really takes a cradle to career approach on education. These are things we need to do throughout from K all the way through people's entire career. We can't segment out the education system and think that this is a, a, a pathway or a mission of one piece of it. This is really an ongoing journey and transition and literacy project for the entire cradle to career system. Another central tenet for Governor Newsom is this idea of high road jobs and high road economic development as we're thinking about all of those potential industries created again through addressing the risks and the opportunities of climate change, we're thinking about making sure that they are high quality, family supporting, decent jobs that allow people to be part of the system that they're helping to solve for and allow people to really have career ladders into the next phase of that system. So all of which to say is for us in the Newsom administration, that systems thinking approach and that idea of that underlying technical and climate literacy for all of us in this room, in our government, and the students that we're working with is critical and important, and I just thank you for thinking about it every day. Now I invite uh, Dr. Marsha McNutt, President of the National Academy of Sciences. Thanks. Uh, I think I'll just speak from here uh, to save time. So uh, I joined the uh, legions in this room who have degrees signed by Governor Brown uh, sitting on, on my wall. 
Uh, but um, I'm pleased to talk today about a, a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, and that is climate education. There are a number of ways that the Academy is involved in this, and I'll briefly mention a few of them and then finish with the K-12 uh, engagement that we're doing. Um, the first is um, using the stature of the Academy to um, make a forceful statement about um, the uh, consensus of uh, agreement on climate science. We've been very concerned when we see polls that in certain sectors of the public, they believe there's no agreement among scientists about anthropogenic climate change. So in response to that, I drafted a statement and the uh, presidents of the National Academy of Medicine and the National Academy of Engineering uh, co-signed that statement that said climate change is happening, we're the cause of it, there's broad agreement on that. Uh, depending on which scientists are polled, it's always more than 90%. And the closer the group of scientists is to climate science, the closer it gets to 100% agreement on that. And that we know enough to take action now. Um, I also wrote an editorial that was recently published that went back to an academy report 40 years ago that predicted that a doubling of CO2 would raise temperature by three degrees plus minus 1.5 degrees C by mid-century, and that the effect of the oceans would lead to a, a sense of complacency in society because it would lead to a decadal delay in the release of the CO2 versus when we would actually feel the effects. And that's exactly what's happening now. And so it pointed out that we have not been asleep at the wheel. We have exactly predicted what would happen, and we are seeing the impacts now. We have also been dealing with misinformation on the web. We have a project with Google to um, uh, deal forthrightly with uh, false information on the web, and have been generating correct content that Google can point to instead of the false content in order to uh, make sure that there are um, uh, websites that they can promote instead of misinformation on the web. Um, we have also been um, uh, elevating the science of science communication. Um, we sometimes are our own worst enemies in how we talk about climate change. Um, Eric gave a very good example when he said, we don't believe in climate science. Climate science is the science. Anyone can verify the evidence for themselves. And when someone says, do you believe in climate science? I don't fall for that trap. I don't fall for that trap. The evidence is the evidence. I have seen the evidence. I can, as an oceanographer, I can go out and verify it. I can see the data. I don't want to put it in the same category as I believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Science is different than religion, and we should not communicate it the same way we communicate about the Easter Bunny. And finally, the Academy has had uh, an enduring program to get climate science into education. Um, we led in creating the next generation uh, science standards, and climate education is an integral part of those next generation science standards. <laughs> 44 states have now adopted those science standards or something very similar to those science standards, standards that are aligned with those science standards. So only six states have not, and those six states will probably come along because very soon they won't be able to get textbooks that are not aligned with the science standards. But here's the problem. The problem is that the science standards are inquiry-based. They're not science as a, a uh, a list of facts. 
but science is something that you can go in and it doesn't matter who you are, you can do an experiment and you can figure things out for yourselves. We need curriculum in order to help the teachers. This is a scary way to teach science for most teachers. Most of them have not had that hands-on kind of experience. So we need to support our teachers with better curriculum in order to make these science standards real and something they can use. Thank you. I'm super happy to introduce our student speaker today. Cool. In it particular. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so after reading through the Eclipse report, I thought that it gave an excellent outline of the need for a systems approach to learning, an increase in our sciences education throughout all grades, and a desire to implement a global mindset and change governmental policy through activism. However, what my peers and I desire, and what I think must be a vital addition to the report, is action, not just activism. I believe that this can be accomplished in the California education system through the nurturing of an experience-based, entrepreneurial spirit in our youth to prepare them to innovate and implement community-minded solutions for their local region and beyond. Throughout my experience at UC San Diego, I've had the pleasure of sharing in and executing this vision with Dr. Keith Fazzoli and Zachary Osborne of the Bioregional Center for Sustainability Science, Planning, and Design, as well as with peers from several on-campus student organizations, such as Rogers Urban Farm Lab. Over the past three years, we, the students, have worked with these groups to design, construct, and now operate a university-scale composting and anaerobic digestion system that has presently captured and converted 70,000 pounds of food waste and 5.6 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent into renewable biogas and fertilizer that feeds a quarter acre garden for the students. Our project has been recognized nationally by the Lummelson MIT Foundation, University of California Office of the President, and the Clinton Foundation for using the entrepreneurial spirit to tackle the trilemma of overfilling landfills, renewable energy demand, and climate change mitigation. I want my own successes in leadership, teamwork, and entrepreneurial development to serve as a model for what students should have the opportunity to experience during their time in the California education system. It's a skill set that 60% of high school students wish was part of their curriculum, according to John Larmer's novel on project-based learning, and a skill set that should be emphasized in the Eclipse report. Additionally, many are concerned about how to increase climate literacy within communities that are not accepting to the climate change data or who are already facing dire consequences of extreme weather events, pollution, and failing agriculture and water supplies. Experiential and entrepreneurial approaches to learning can especially teach students within these groups to recognize the problems that face their specific communities and work with their community leaders and regional experts to address climate change in a way that provides local employment and increases standard of living. For example, the daughter of an industrial dairy farmer can revolutionize her family's operations to be more carbon neutral, not by shutting down business and seizing the production of meat and dairy from cows, which would be the extreme case of what activism encourages in the Eclipse Report, but instead by using the entrepreneurial, experience-based approach to establish an emission-mitigating anaerobic digestion plant that could lower electricity costs and greenhouse gas emissions via biogas generation. With the same general approach, a student living in a marginalized neighborhood suffering from poor air quality could be inspired to engage in citizen science and test the pollution levels in their area of the city and provide the evidence needed to advocate for more stringent climate policy and planning within their local neighborhood. This would not have been accomplished if the only goal, as outlined by the Eclipse Report, was teaching young minds that the only thing that they could do to stop the destruction of their communities is to beg government, an already strained entity, um, as Professor Brown mentioned, uh, to do something about it. <laughs> um, the Eclipse Report excels at addressing the need for an us with them approach to climate change literacy to encompass global stewardship, but in doing so, fails to realize that in order to make global change that can benefit all people, one must start local, learn and create change within their community, and then expand to wider frontiers. Therefore, if we truly desire for the adoption of the Eclipse Report's policies to be a climate renaissance, a green metamorphosis that roots itself in a closed-loop, systems-based approach rather than a single-stream conglomerate economy, we must first appreciate the portions of the market-based system that have led to unparalleled technological development 
and must use its successful entrepreneurial and independent community-reminded roots to inspire the social, environmental, and technical evolution we wish to impart through community building, divestment in corporations against our interests, and investment in the youth and the innovations they have and will create. Thank you. Now we hear from the perspective of a foundation, from the Hewlett Foundation, Peter. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's always an honor to come back to UCLA and, and be in front of a room of distinguished uh, climate scientists and educators. Um, for those of you staying at the hotel, I don't know if you heard a bunch of students last night yelling at around midnight. It is finals week on the campus, and there's this tradition here called the midnight yell. So what you are hearing was a bunch of students engaging in this UCLA tradition. And I will tell you, it, is, it was much more civilized last night than when I was a student here. So, <laughs> so you guys got a PG version of what the midnight yell is. Um, I work at the Hewlett Foundation. I'm a program officer. Uh, a little bit of an anomaly, I feel like, on this stage. Uh, we actually have an environment team at the foundation that works very uh, heavily and very committed to renewable energy uh, climate reduction, and Western conservation. I am not a part of that team. Uh, the family uh, did believe in uh, Western conservation and climate um, change, and I will tell you that that is the biggest team in our foundation. I'm actually a part of the, the education team, and our, our team is a lot smaller, uh, but a lot more concentrated on K-12, or primarily concentrated on K-12 uh, education. And I'll share a couple of anecdotes with you about what we are up to and what we do and why this is important, right? So we just recently uh, received a report that got some press. It was a grant that we had given to a professor at Stanford, uh, some other university in the state, not as important as UCLA. But he did this study where they surveyed students and, and they gave them various prompts, right? And one of the prompts was to it, it was a climate change prompt that was produced by the fossil fuel industry. And the students could not decipher where the resources were coming for this prompt, and they couldn't decipher the facts on that prompt, right? So they couldn't clearly articulate that it was uh, put together by the fossil fuel industry, arguing that there wasn't, climate change wasn't an issue. Which leads us to where we're at at the foundation in terms of a, a piece of work that we call deeper learning. Deeper learning is really engaging students on critical thinking skills and asking them to really engage the content, be able to communicate it, be able to decipher it, uh, and be able to present uh, arguments based on what they see. Um, so we are currently working with, uh, or trying to identify school districts across the country uh, to partner with, to push these competencies to students so that they can begin to engage in these deeper learning competencies. I, what I will say is uh, the governor, we're a national funder, and the governor uh, was entirely correct. We are in a bubble in California. As I travel the country and see what other school systems and other states are doing, um, we are leaps uh, far and above beyond what other places are doing in terms of just our engagement in our educational reforms. I think the challenge um, that has encountered not just California, but the country, and again, the, the governor is, is, has left, but he, he moved us away from this focus on reading and math. Um, and there's still some advocacy groups in this state that are pushing for high, and for the educators in the room, I think you're very well aware of this, the, the focus on reading and math test scores. Uh, the governor moved us away from that in the state and has created the space for us to do interdisciplinary work, right? So when you think of the climate uh, and the environment change stuff, um, work that you can do in classrooms, and I was reading the report, um, there is space, and, and this is what the foundation is seeking to do, there is space for folks to do inter interdisciplinary work. So what you saw the teacher describe in her classroom today around project-based learning and engaging students on this curriculum, that exists and that's what the foundation is trying to, to uplift in schools. Um, I will say that it's not, it's, it's not easy work. I think the universities, uh, the UCs and the Cal States have a large 
role to play in how we prepare the next generation of teachers. It'll be critically important about how we get them to focus on in interdisciplinary work and be able to, to teach these, these methods in their classrooms. And the last thing I'll end with is, in reading the report, one of the things that, quite honestly, I feel is missing and is really prevalent in our work is that this work needs to be led by the youth. The youth have agency, they have voice, and th that needs to be uplifted in this work. And it's always an honor to hear the youth perspective, but it also needs to be engaging and led by youth as well, because we adults, we don't know everything. The youth have a much more active and prevalent role in what can happen. I, I have to make a quick check with my boss here, uh, Lee Levine. How much time do we have for, I know we are 15 minutes behind overall. Can we take about 12 minutes for questions? Okay, can they set the clock so I know I can watch it? All right. I have uh, uh, one question for Kate Gordon and Marsha McNaught. What are the things we need to do and what are the things we shouldn't do when we try to scale it up? How do we scale up what we are talking about here? Uh, we can hear from the state's perspective and the national perspective from Marsha. The question to Enid is that she's at UCSD. It's the first time I'm seeing her. If we come to, to get students help, for we want to mandate every student at UCSD, whether or not they are science majors, to take a course on climate change. How do we do that? How do we approach the students for doing that? We are, in, I'm seeking your help, we are in the process of doing exactly that. Have it's once in the student take at least one course in climate change, whether their major is humanities, arts, or social science, what have you. So for Peter, is that we have major foundations in California doing work on climate change. Hewlett itself is probably one of the major ones. How do we approach these foundations? Well, as part of your climate mitigation, take up the portfolio of education of Californians. I think uh, uh, Kate said, cradle to career education. I think of it as cradle to grave education. We need to educate everyone. Thank you. So let's start with uh, Kate and then go down. Sure, thank you. I, I, I think with retirement ages going up, cradle to grave is cradle to career at this point. So <laughs> it's uh, uh, <laughs> essentially the same thing. Uh, but uh, it's, it's a great question and, and it'll sound like a broken record from me, but uh, this my career has mostly been in uh, working with diverse allies, talking in uh, to folks who are not kind of among the the, the converted, if you will, on climate. Um, a lot of work, particularly before this, and it's relevant, doing a, founding a project and running a project called the Risky Business Project, which was with, um, interestingly, two now presidential candidates, Tom Steyer, Mike Bloomberg, and Hank Paulson, looking at the uh, economic risk to climate change across the U.S. And I bring it up because what that project did was position climate change in terms of investments and assets and business, like realities of economics. And I think that's incredibly important to think about who's our audience. Again, so how do we scale this up? I think we scale it up by acknowledging there's not one way to talk about it, and there's not one way to educate about it, honestly. That there's a basic literacy, and I absolutely believe that, a basic literacy people should know, and Kaiser Health News just did this very disturbing survey that shows that they don't. People should know where our energy comes from, what basically is leading to climate change. I mean, there's, there's a basic literacy element here, the basic physics I think someone talked about, Matt talked about. But there also needs to be integration across all disciplines. People are excited about different things. They're living different realities. They're experiencing different climate impacts. They have different energy mixes. There's all kinds of different things going on. We need to start where people are. And that's how we broaden the base, and that's how we broaden the literacy, and that's how we get more and more and more people engaged in this project. I think we all need to do that across whatever institution we're in. Okay, so um, picking up where uh, Kate is, um, I think that's the sort of genius of the next generation science standards, is that they say this is sort of a basis of literacy, 
but they allow all sorts of local and regional tailoring so that um, states and school districts can make them relevant to the people um, there. And I, it's very important, especially when you're talking about climate, that you talk about impacts that are real to that location. So whether they are health impacts, whether they are economic impacts, whether they are environmental impacts, that those can be uh, emphasized. Um, but I think in terms of scaling up, what is really key here is, as I think all of the teachers in the room know, it's all about um, how you can get um, actual physical curriculum that the, into the teacher's hands. And the three states that tend to really drive the curriculum, which then will determine what the kids are actually uh, using, are the three big, well, there are four big markets. There's Texas, there's Florida, there's California, and New York. Well, Texas and Florida are two of the six states that have not yet adopted the science standards. So that means that California and New York can drive the conversation right now of what the curriculum looks like so that by the time Florida and Texas get on board, California and New York already have the curriculum in place. So I think this is a big opportunity to, um, for, for these two states to get a really high quality curriculum going in climate science. All right, and uh, to answer your question about uh, climate science course for everyone, uh, just to give context about UCSD, it has six different colleges, um, each of which is has different general education requirements and is focused more either towards environmentalism, such as Muir College, or into, um, say, like more along the scientific route, like Raval. Um, if we were going to implement a general climate change course that was a requirement for everyone, I... I would honestly suggest, one, making it project-based. Um, and I don't think, if we're going to implement an actual project-based class, that um, a single quarter would not be enough to actually see an impact from that and the long-term impacts um, that you could have from a, such a project-based class. And I think it would need to be community-minded. So like everyone in the class is put into a group. Um, and it's designed so that you're in a group with you know, it's required that you're in a group with different majors um, so that you can basically, you know, be more or less forced to interact with other majors because that never happens at UCSD. Uh, you don't interact with other people. Um, so, um, so, yeah, you'd be forced to do it, and then you'd be given a task and be like, okay, look, you're, you have to find a solution to a climate change issue that's happening within the San Diego community. Um, and so if you're going to solve a problem in the community and make sure that it has a long-term staying power of any sort, I think that it would need to at least be a year-long course. Um, and that being said, I feel like it would need to have uh, a general, the general education requirements for all of the colleges would need, need to be changed to revolve around that. Because otherwise, you know, like everyone is just in their own different directions. People, so from my own experience, um, I didn't really see a lot of value in the general education requirements that I had to take. And um, I think that that should be changed. And um, I think that's a great way to do it. Okay. So in terms of how to approach foundations, you, you know, I, unfortunately I have spent a little time around foundations and I have found them to be very siloed niche places, right? Everybody has their focus, whether it, and I'm talking about from a K-12 perspective or education perspective, whether it's high school reform or early childhood education. I think the challenge for, for, for folks to really get uh, the climate and environment uh, curriculum built in is you, sometimes you can't lead with that. You, if it's, for us, it's project-based learning. So she was just talking about the importance of project-based learning. So how do you integrate the, the, the environmental and climate change curriculum into project-based learning, that's something that would speak to a foundation like Hewlett. Uh, there's a lot of funders who are focused in the early childhood education space, right? 
Uh, how do you talk about climate and environmental preservation in the ECE or early childhood uh, lens? So there's, there's ways of doing it, and it's about knowing uh, the focus of the foundation or the family or the philanthropy and really finding ways of embedding uh, the content into whatever it is uh, that family or that foundation may be interested in. Uh, there's ways to do it. Thank you. Let's give a round of applause for our panel.